So if you're just coming in now, you can grab a midterm after lecture. Some of you have grabbed them now. Let me give you a little overall feedback. The mean score was two points higher on this midterm than on midterm one. A lot of really good scores. I think you're learning that you gotta work quickly, know your stuff, not obscure facts, but and then on the compare and contrast, and the essay, no principles. So we'll probably keep, again, it's the total points at the end of the whole course with the section grade and the final exam grade that will determine your score, but 60s-ish A, 50s-ish B, 40s-ish C, that's a little bit more lenient than the 90%, 80%, 70%, but that's about where we are, and uh, people clearly picked up their game on midterm two compared to midterm one overall. And you can talk about it more this week in section, et cetera, et cetera. So, as you know in this course, we have to move fairly quickly, so we're gonna get into learning disorders. And you'd think, well, pretty personal lecture Monday, bipolar disorder, hospitalizations, learning disorders, not as severe, milder, but if you wanna talk about stigma in a society like ours that values achievement and performance, and you look like you've got it together and you speak okay, and you fail in school, learning disorders are highly stigmatized. We'll talk more about that as we go. So, as with many opening slides and many lectures, you've kind of got to know the terms here. Often these are called learning disabilities, which means that your performance in math or in reading or in writing is worse than you'd predict on the basis of your other cognitive skills or on the basis of your intelligence. There's some mystery here. Looks like you should be able to do it. You don't have an intellectual disability overall. That's the topic of the next lecture, Monday of next week. You're not, quote, mentally retarded. So why is it that you've got this discrepancy? Why is it that you look like you should be reading fine, but you're not? Then we get into the Greek terms that are still used. Dyslexia. You're not doing as well as you should in the lexical process of reading. Dyscalculia. Math disability. Dysgraphia, which is what I have, terrible handwriting, right? The term that's been used in the DSMs for the last couple of editions is learning disorder rather than learning disability. I'm not quite sure why. Maybe they thought it would be less stigmatizing. So the idea here is you've got issues in reading or math or writing that aren't explained by being blind or deaf, and they aren't explained by intellectual disability or the fact that you've never been to school. There's something going on, so think of wait, the harmful dysfunction. Pretty harmful in our society not to be able to achieve academically. But we can't explain it on the basis of the usual suspects. Well, you couldn't hear what the teacher's saying, or you've got an IQ below 70. There's something mysterious to ex that we've got to invoke to explain why you've got this specific disorder. So, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, for a long time, learning disability or learning disorder has been defined in the United States as a very specific kind of gap. We give you an IQ test, that shows how smart you are. Of course, there's a big debate on whether IQ tests really do that. And your reading is way below how smart you are, because how smart you are is supposed to predict how well you read. So you've got an above average IQ, but below average reading. That was the basis, until very recently, for defining a reading disability or a reading disorder. But as we'll talk about, there's big problems with the use of the IQ versus achievement discrepancy model. Interesting history of this, but there's big problems with using it. So that's just to give you a kind of hint. What's a communication disorder? Not so much written language or written symbols, but your ability to understand language or express language. How well do you comprehend? How well are you able to articulate the words of a language? So those are the communication disorders. So those are the terms. Now it turns out that the language and communication side of things and the reading side of things are very closely intertwined. What did you hear when you grew up? Well, I hear when I grew up especially, things are changing somewhat. If you've got a reading disorder, it's because you see a small b and you think it's a d, or you think it's a p and it's a q. It's a visual, you reverse letters. Does that happen in young kids? Pretty frequently, boys especially. Remember, boys' brains are pretty well behind girls' brains for so the first few years of life. Usually that goes away. But only about 10 to 15% of people with significant reading disorders truly flip things around and have mirror image. The vast majority of people with reading disorders have a fundamental problem, not in the visual system, but in the auditory language system. So, what's a phoneme? A phoneme is the smallest meaningful unit of sound in a language. How many phonemes are there in English? 44. What's the most simple phonetic language on earth? Italian. What's the rate of reading disability in Italy? The lowest in the world. What are very difficult languages? Chinese where you've got pictograms, Finnish, which has 60 plus phonemes. Rates of reading disorders are higher. Most problems in reading are predicted by the problems little kids have in distinguishing those phonemic units. And then when you get to kindergarten and first grade, what is that? stick with the two humps on the side. That's a B, but it makes the sound B, so there's a difference between the letter name and the letter sound, and then you've got to put that together with the little funny thing called an A that makes either an A or an A, B, A, and then those two L's, and you've got to quickly be able to see the symbol, know the phonemic sound associated with it, and blend it together. This is the magical process of reading. It takes place sometimes, because kids are self-taught at four, five, kindergarten, earlier and earlier, six, seven, this is when you have to have mastered it. So, one of the biggest predictors of kids who by third, fourth, and fifth grade are really behind in their reading is, you can test them back at age four in preschool or five in kindergarten, and they are not very quick at distinguishing the phonemes. It's called phonemic awareness. Because if you don't really quickly understand the differences between those sounds and that those symbols represent those sounds, you're gonna have a heck of a time doing what you have to do to read, make that automatic. So what happens when you read a really hard word in some ling linguistics course you're taking now? You kind of sound it out, all those syllables. You go back to like the time you were learning to read. But most words you read now, you don't sound it out, boom, it's automatic. Because all of that phonemic processing has become automatized. If it hasn't, what happens when you read? Every single friggin' syllable and word is effortful. And you don't have any of your mind space left over for comprehension. So, this is a big shift. We used to think that reading problems were mainly visual and reversals, and now the field is pretty convinced that the root of most reading problems is phonemic, auditory, and sound symbol connections. So we can do a fairly good job now, before kids learn to read, in the preschool years, of giving a certain battery of tests about phonemic awareness, and of course, how many letters of the alphabet you've memorized, and even number skills, pretty interesting numeric skills, that's a pretty good predictor of a couple years later whether you're gonna pick up this reading thing quickly and automatically or not. And it also takes out of the equation, oh God, we've gotta give an IQ test too. And only if you're really smart on the IQ test and you're not very good in reading can we define a reading disorder. The research has shown that 
kind of screw the IQ testing. If you can pick out these phonological processes early, that's going to predict reading whether your IQ is genius range, high average range, average, or low average. So the researchers said, we, we can skip this step of getting this long, hairy IQ test and forming these discrepancy scores. So we'll talk about that further in a minute because that's still how it's done in most states. But what about behavior? Not just phonemic awareness, phonological awareness. If you had to observe a classroom of preschoolers or kindergartners, and you were trying to pluck out who's going to really have these reading problems in a few years, well, what would you think? The kids who are fidgeting and squirming, the kids who are aggressive and throwing spit wads, those are predictors. But what's the biggest predictor? Whether the kid's paying attention to the teacher and whether the kid can sit, kid can sit for a few minutes in circle time. Inattention is the behavior that's by far the biggest predictor of later learning and reading problems. And it kind of makes sense. If you're really not tuned in to the teacher's voice and the teacher's pointing to those funny things on the board called letters, you're going to have trouble automatizing it. Question here. This is inattention. Is that ADHD or is it the early sign of a reading disorder? It's a complicated and important question. When you get a little bit older in grade school, here's how you tell if you're a clinician. If the kid during reading lessons can't sit still and is inattentive and distracted, but is perfectly attentive all the rest of the time, that's not ADHD. That's probably a reading disorder. But if the kid is generally inattentive during math and at recess and while reading, that's probably ADHD in addition to the reading disorder. So you look for the pervasiveness of the inattention. Because if you really have problems with phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, you can't sit still, you can't pay attention to the teacher, does it's hard. But if that's the only domain in which you have that, it's probably not ADHD. Make sense? Other questions about this? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so low verbal ability. Family adversity, what did Moffat say? Those are two of the big risk factors for the early onset conduct problem, especially when you've got the triple threat with early ADHD. So it's the risk factors multiplying together, right? It turns out that you'd think, well, of course, the kids who are being aggressive are going to be the poor learners. If you put into the equation early inattention, that's the really true risk factor. And kids who don't learn well in school the first couple of grades, as a result of that, tend to get aggressive. But by the teenage years, now you're in middle school, aggression is part and parcel of learning disability. So it's developmentally timed. Early inattention is the bigger risk factor. Right here. Yeah, so this is, we talked about this a little bit back a few weeks ago with ADHD. Is it that I'm not paying attention, or I'm paying attention to that mosquito sound outside, and my rumblings in my stomach because it's almost lunch, and the sound of the chalk on the board? I'm so attentive to everything else, I'm distractible, maybe I'm over-attentive to the wrong things. Nobody really knows with ADHD if it's inattention or kind of over-attention to multiple stimuli. That's still being debated. Yeah, so if I've got a reading disorder, what happens? There's all these little friggin' things and symbols called words on the page, and I'm not very good at it. And I've had a history now for a year or two of being frustrated by it. So I'm laboring over each one, sounding out, moving my lips, and the other kids are laughing. Can't read, stupid, because the other kids are doing it automatically. So you're going to look around and say, God, maybe I know that other word. And you're kind of jumping to get a cue for yourself. Reading's not smooth. So it might be there that that distracted attention is the result of the phonological problems, not so much the cause of the reading problem. It gets complicated. Who else? Good questions about all this stuff. Let's move ahead. So the communication disorders, just so we've talked about it a bit. The classic one is expressive language disorder. So here's another puzzle. Here's a little kid, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, who seems to understand directions, multi-part directions. But they cannot speak in the full sentences or their speech is so hard to understand that no one's really quite getting what they say. So a receptive language disorder would mean you can hear, but you can't really get what someone's saying. Expressive language disorder, sometimes called aphasia in adults, is you're getting it, you can take it in, but you're not able to put it back out. So when you're dealing with preschoolers, you'd say, well, that kid's a late bloomer. What is an important moderator variable here? Gender. What if you've got a two and a half or three-year-old boy, and the family comes to you as a speech and hearing specialist and says, you know, he started a preschool, and all, all the girls are speaking in full paragraphs, and most of the boys are speaking in full sentences, and he can only put two words together, go ball, bye-bye daddy. Sounds really behind. Is that a problem, doctor? For a boy at two and a half or so, going on three, to have a maximum of two word sentences, predicts what? About half the time, just wait a year and he'll be fine. Because boys are slower. Boys' brains are slower to mature. The other half the time, that's a sign. What if same problem, exact problem, it's the same age girl? What are the odds? 90% she's got an expressive language disorder. Because it's way less normative for a girl not to be speaking in full sentences by two and a half, three. So with a boy, you want to be a little more cautious and say, well, maybe more language stimulation. Let's wait and see. Call me in three months, six months. With a girl, you're probably going to intervene quickly. Because the developmental curve is so different in language development for boys and girls. What's phonological disorder? This won't be on the test, but just so you've heard of it. So this doesn't mean, it's a funny name. It doesn't really make much sense. It's not whether you can understand phonemes, but are you speaking at a rate that's way too fast, way too slow, and can we understand you at all? It used to be called disarticulation. What do a lot of kids do? They can't really say R's very well, and they say W's, right? Sounds funny, and then most little kids sort of mature out of that. But what if you're in second grade, and you're still talking like that? So you would be diagnosed with a phonological disorder. Some kids by the early grades not only aren't speaking in the full sentences that most kids do, but they don't seem to understand the multi-part directions the teacher's giving. That would be called a mixed receptive and expressive language disorder. But what's the differential diagnosis there? Maybe the kid's got an intellectual disability. Maybe the kid's got a general cognitive deficit. So that's where you might bring in IQ testing, especially the kind of testing that doesn't require language. It's all visual, for example, or making analogies to see if this language disorder is part of a more general cognitive delay. We're not going to talk about it, but stuttering disorder, very embarrassing. People, adults who stutter, shy away from public speaking. It looks like social phobia, it's really stuttering. And there's some very specific treatments that can help that. So just to, for your attention, not so much for comprehension of this. So let's get back to reading disorders, the vast majority of reading disorders, and this discrepancy model. The only way in most states still, although it's gradually changing, to get diagnosed as a reading disordered kid, got a reading disability, you're dyslexic. The psychologist has to give you an IQ test. This is a one-on-one -on -one test. It takes an hour and a half. It gives you scores on how verbal you are and your kind of spatial performance abilities and how fast you process information. And to give you a reading battery, and there's got to be a gap. You've got to be at least average in your IQ or way above, and your reading falls below. But that makes it interesting. What if your IQ score is 140? Quote, you're a genius. But your reading score is 110. You're reading above average. But you're two standard deviations below in your reading than you are in your IQ. You've got a reading disorder. 
but I was reading above average. Yeah, but you should be reading way above average. So when you get into the discrepancy model, it's fine. You can get kids doing above average compared to other kids who are diagnosed as disordered. On the contrary, in contrast, you take the IQ test and you get a 90. You're in the 30th, 38th percentile. You're not, quote, intellectually disabled, but you, you're not as smart as the average, and your reading is 85. You're in the 20th or 16th percentile. You're reading way below normal. No reading disorder, why? Because there's only a five-point gap between your IQ and your reading. So by using the discrepancy score, who gets diagnosed with a reading disorder? Middle-class kids, usually white kids, with high IQ scores who are reading less well than their IQ would predict. Who can never get diagnosed with a reading disorder? Poor kids or kids with cognitive delays, because even though they're doing terrible in reading, it's not that different from their IQ. So the political argument here is the discrepancy model will only get special services for middle-class kids. And the researchers are saying, it doesn't friggin' matter if your IQ is 140 versus 90. If you're not reading well, it's mainly because of these phonological deficits. So the whole discrepancy thing was kind of like a, a show that we didn't need to have in place. So here's terms you don't need to know, but it's always great to hear how the British do things. So 40 years ago, Sir Michael Rudder, most famous child psychiatrist in the world, Sir William Ewell, colleague of his, wanted to test this out. So they defined two groups of kids. One group of kids had pretty high IQs and reading scores that were way below. What do they call that group? SRR, specific reading retardation. Lousy name, because it doesn't mean mental retardation. And then they picked a bigger group of kids who just had bad reading scores, regardless of their IQ, and they called that general reading backwardness. Nice stigmatizing English term, right? So they were trying to say, are the kids with the discrepancy, the specific reading retarded kids, different from the kids who just had low reading scores, regardless of their IQ? Well, the kids with general reading backwardness had lower IQs, and they came from poorer backgrounds, and they had other risk factors. And what happened three years later? They made age-expected progress in reading. The kids with the specific reading retardation, by definition kids with relatively high IQs, but a big gap, they're reading, higher IQ, higher social class, protective factors, and they made almost no gains in reading. So this, for a while, gave the discrepancy people some hope. Maybe there is something about people with good cognitive abilities who have the specific reading deficit that really predicts trouble in reading. The problem is, other studies in England and the United States and elsewhere, with more careful definitions, show that whether you've got the discrepancy, like the SSR group, or whether your reading is just behind, regardless of your IQ, the longer you go, the harder it is to catch up in reading. So there's not as big a difference as we once thought between the discrepancy group and the non-discrepancy group. Now, what's the implication? It's your kid, and your kid in second grade, they're threatening to put in a special class. And your kid is crying every night in homework and refuses to do the out of the cat and the hat and the dick and Jane book, the second grade reading book. And it's a battle every night, and you know your kid's suffering, he's not reading. So you go to the school and say, for God's sake, why don't you do some testing? My kid's got a reading disorder. So what happens? Well, they give an IQ test, and your kid's in average or above average range, and reading's a bit below. But at the second grade level, how much can you read anyway? So it's hard to get a discrepancy as a second grader. When can you get a discrepancy? Now you're in fourth grade, and the reading's more complicated, and your IQ's about the same, and now you're reading way behind. This is called a simple term in schools of education. It's called the wait and fail method. Wait till the kid has really suffered, fourth and fifth grade, and has failed and has a miserable self-esteem, and now give the diagnosis. That's the problem with the discrepancy model. You can't really get discrepant until you're old enough and have enough reading material under your belt to really have a difference. So everything is now shifting to earlier identification, phonological and phonemic awareness tests. Screw the IQ tests by and large. You might need it for other purposes. And see if you can pick out these early auditory, auditory to visual phonemic deficits, even in the preschool or kindergarten years, and do some preventive intervention, not the wait and fail method. Make sense? How many states have gone to this model? Almost none. Even though the research is showing the discrepancy model is kind of bogus, state by state, you still have to have the IQ test and the big gap before you get diagnosed. Because what are the states? Or they don't want half the districts to have more and more kids with reading disorder because they're strapped enough for cash. So it's an economic and political battle. Question. Somebody had their hand up, I think. Yeah. So I sort of missed your first sentence. How would you get this public test if there's no gap at the early age? Well, maybe advanced and enlightened preschools or kindergartens would do some screening of kids in kindergarten, not necessarily to diagnose 20% of the kindergartners as learning disabled, but to say, here's some kids who are going to have more trouble than usual with phonological awareness, and maybe we could do some group intervention to try to boost it, or language stimulation. So part of the issue here is the special ed model is, oh, you've got a disability in you, and you're pulled out for, rather than the whole classroom, might benefit from different interventions. So the fact that special ed is largely a pull-out exclusionary deficit model is another reason why this whole sort of discrepancy special ed thing might be going backwards. Make sense? Yeah, question here. So right, it's hard in life to have instant replay. You can do it in TiVo, you can do it on Sports Center, but in life, you do the intervention and it's hard to go back. This is why you use a randomized trial. What does a randomized intervention mean? So you've got 100 kids and 50 get assigned to the special reading program and 50 get assigned to, let's say 150, get assigned to a different one and 50 to the control group. The kids in the control group who aren't getting this intervention, they're the ones that you're assuming you've gone back to instant replay with, right? Because they shouldn't differ from the kids who got the intervention on anything other than the fact that the coin was tails versus heads. 